Okay. Um, do we have anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question? First of all, I find what you're doing beauty itself. It's not even beautiful. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, sir. And thank you so much, man. Huge fan. I remember at one point I was going through a breakup and you were talking about uh, love and yeah. how the problem of love in these days is like making the other person in a godlike state, yeah. which ruins the whole thing. Sure. And the, everything you're talking about is so mind-oriented. Yeah. And how do you think being in the mind can we get to true love? Can we get to that fascinating experience, like long-term? Because I've heard, I've, I've seen you say that you went through a lot of different breakups, yeah. you know? Sure, yeah. And do you think, how can we get there yeah. with everything that's going on with, with the mind? Yeah, Thank so, you. so, you know, I, I would never want to reduce the metaphysics of the romantic imagination to neurology, but neuroscientists will say that romantic love at the neurochemical level is an addiction, like an addiction to sugar or an addiction to drugs. Um, I think it's an addiction worth having, personally. But uh, our wiring, one of the limitations of our wiring is hedonic adaptation. Hedonic adaptation simply means that what gives you pleasure in small doses over two, enough large doses will cease giving you pleasure. It's like when you've watched the same movie or listened to the song a thousand times, it doesn't do what it used to do to you anymore. And one of the tragedies of romantic relationships for some people is they experience this hedonic adaptation and they start to take the person for granted. And that's a major existential bummer because you know you love this person, right? You're with them and you remember how elated they make you feel and they're there and maybe you still love them intellectually but maybe you don't feel that n rush of neuropinephrine and dopamine and all these chemicals of love. Um, I, one of the hacks that I had as a kid, or I, mean, I, I still do it sometimes, when I was in love, I do a lot of videotaping. I take pictures and document all kinds, make videos of, of my girlfriend, like a lot of videos. And then what I do is, I, you know how when you break up with somebody, then you start looking at all the old photographs and you get all sad and you're like, why didn't I appreciate her when I was still with her? So I would do that while I was still with the person. Spend the whole day, make a bunch of videos, good night, sweetheart, and then I go home and look at the pictures and pretend I had lost, I trick myself into mourning for this person in order to appreciate them like it was new again, and then the next morning I'd be so happy they were still in my life. So I practiced <laughs> their absence to appreciate them. It was my hack. And again, this all comes from just a, an unwillingness to surrender to oh, you can't control it, or this is how it is, and this is just natural. Like, I didn't sign up for these terms. If I want to be in an elated state of love forever with somebody, what is the hack? What is the creative solution that will overcome this limitation? Now, there's a philosopher called David Pierce. He wrote an essay on the internet called The Hedonistic Imperative, okay? Talk about hedonic adaptation. And his idea is that he thinks it's moral for human beings to employ technologies, right? Whether it's biotech and nanotech, to reverse engineer consciousness, to eliminate human suffering from the equation. That's not to say that we won't still want to have aesthetic suffering. Like sometimes a sad song is cool and a sad mu a movie is good. But like actual morbid suffering, right? Like the kind of anxiety and clinical depression that exists at epidemic levels today, that we have a moral imperative to fix that. But what he also says is it's not just about fixing the sick, but about making well people better. So how cool would it be if we could fix our hedonic limitations so that even if we feel like we're doing all right, we could crank ourselves up to be like super joyous and blissful beings, you know? Now, there's going to be all kinds of questions about that. It starts to sound a little bit like the, like the book Brave New World, you know? But still, I, I would like to see a world where people are able to tap into states of grace and bliss. My friends Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel have written a new book called Stealing Fire, about the Promethean legend of stealing fire. Um, and, and, and the idea behind the book is that there's $4 trillion that are spent every year to get out of our heads, to hack how we feel, whether it's by watching sports matches or going partying with friends or travel or falling in love or watching movies, experiences that make us feel elated, you know, whether it's love or all these other experiences. People spend $4 trillion to get into these blissful states. And so the book documents this hidden revolution that he calls a knobs and levers approach to perception where human beings are learning to master the contents of their brain. He calls it stewardship of internal life. You know, meditators do it. Yogis do it. I mean, there's all kinds of, of, of systems that exist 
to take control of the, of the monkey mind, you know, of the inner critic, and to tap into these states of grace. And I would like to see that become even more mainstream because I think grace and bliss and gratitude are fundamental human rights. I think we all should have the right to experience these states of empathy and bliss and compassion that enlarge our spirit. And I just want everybody to have that, you know? Thank you. Right down in there.